The mighty Sierra Nevada is an absolutely beautiful mountain range that composes the backbone of California and offers prime outdoor recreation to millions. Running some 400 miles from Tehachapi Pass in the south to Fredonia Pass in the north, the range peaks at 14,505 feet on Mount Whitney, making it the highest mountain range in the contiguous United States. Meaning snowy mountains in Spanish, the Sierra Nevada are aptly named, as they receive copious amounts of snow in the winter, contain over a dozen active but shrinking glaciers, and are home to several world-class ski resorts. The Sierras are iconic, home to world-renowned localities such as Yosemite, Lake Tahoe, and Mount Whitney. But how did this beautiful mountain range form? What is the story behind the scenery? We're going to answer these questions and more in today's episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. Let's start by talking rocks. The Sierra Nevada story begins roughly 500 million years ago in the Cambrian period, which would be when the oldest rocks that would eventually compose the Sierras were deposited. This was when the Mount Aggie formation of the Morrison Block was deposited in what would become the Convict Lake area, between Mammoth Mountain and Bishop. Much like the San Gabriel Mountains near Los Angeles, these rocks in the Sierras are metasedimentary rocks, meaning they are metamorphic rocks with sedimentary protoliths. The Morrison Block contains marble, slate, schist, and hornfells, and these oldest rocks are known as roof pendants, named as such because they outcrop above the main plutonic rock that composes the vast majority of the Sierra Nevada, but more on that later. From 500 to about 250 million years ago, what would eventually become the Sierra Nevada was, much like the rest of the western US, a shallow sea. Sedimentary rocks were depositing, as the west coast was a passive margin, an area where continental crust transitions to oceanic crust in the absence of a fault line, much like the Atlantic coast of the US today. This all changed at the beginning of the Mesozoic era, roughly 250 million years ago in the Triassic period, when the area transitioned into a subduction zone. The Sierra Magmatic Arc began its formation during the Triassic period as a suite of island arcs began accreting to the western margin of North America. This accreted the majority of the metamorphic and sedimentary rocks on the western slopes of the Sierras, including the famous western metamorphic belt, which is integral to the vast gold fields of the area. The western metamorphic belt consists of mainly mafic and ultramafic strata, including limestone, serpentinite, amphibolite, phyllite, green schist, and basalt. This reflects the oceanic island arc origin of these accreted terrains. Geographically, this suite of rocks lies on the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada, beneath the high peaks of the range. Magmatic arc formation occurred in conjunction with terrain accretion in the Triassic Proto-Sierras, but it was limited to only a few areas in the northern and western margins of the Sierras. After the aforementioned exotic terrains finished accreting in the area, magmatic arc formation really took off. During the Jurassic period, roughly 200 million years ago, the Farallon Plate began subducting under the North American Plate, generating a long volcanic chain above the subducting slab. This volcanism built the Sierras, and it lasted roughly 200 million years in total, from the early Triassic 250 million years ago to roughly 80 million years ago in the late Cretaceous. One last pulse of terrain accretion occurred 155 to 145 million years ago in an event known as the Nevada Orogeny, but the vast majority of the mountain building in the Sierras from 200 to 80 million years ago was volcanic arc magmatism. The vast majority of the bedrock of the Sierra Nevada is made of the ancient core of this volcanic arc, composed of a plutonic igneous rock known as granodiorite. The granodiorite of the Sierra Nevada is pretty much one gigantic block, and it is referred to as the Sierra Nevada batholith. The extrusive rocks of the Sierra Arc that erupted above the core of the volcanoes has since eroded away, exposing the intrusive core of the arc. Sediments in the Great Valley west of the Sierras are largely made of these volcanic remains. Most people refer to the Sierra Nevada as being composed of granite, which is technically not true, 
Granite has a different chemical composition and signature than granodiorite does, and the Sierras are made of granodiorite. Granite is more felsic than granodiorite is, meaning it contains more quartz and orthoclase feldspar than granodiorites do. In fact, orthoclase is pretty rare in the Sierra Nevada. Plagioclase, the other main feldspar mineral, dominates in the Sierra Nevada's rocks. Granodiorite of the Sierra Nevada batholith is largely composed of biotite, hornblende, plagioclase, and quartz. From 30 to about 5 million years ago, large pyroclastic flows were deposited in the Sierras, especially in canyons, from volcanoes east of the range in Nevada. These volcanoes were both attributed to crustal extension and subduction, as the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate built the ancestral cascades above the northern and east of the central and southern Sierra block at this time. As the San Andreas Fault pushed north, so did the volcanoes, and today, the furthest south volcanic center in the Cascades is Lassen Peak. Certain areas of the Sierra Nevada used to be part of the Cascades as recently as 2 million years ago, including Castle Peak near Donner Pass, Mount Pluto and Mount Rose near Lake Tahoe, and certain peaks near Kirkwood south of Lake Tahoe. Today, the boundary between the Sierra Nevada and the Cascades is denoted by a shift in bedrock from the mainly Cretaceous Plutonic rock south of Fredonia Pass to the contemporary volcanic rock north of the pass. The youngest rocks in the Sierra Nevada are 51,000-year-old volcanic rocks that erupted out of Mammoth Mountain. Active volcanism remains in the Sierras, but is attributed to basin and range crustal extension rather than subduction, which we'll discuss now. We just discussed how the rocks in the Sierra Nevada were formed, but how did the range get uplifted to its current height of 14,505 feet above sea level? The Sierras have a long and complicated uplift history, but as just alluded to, the main story here occurred relatively recently, geologically speaking at least, during the onset of basin and range crustal extension. There are several differing models of modern Sierra uplift, but most agree that it began slowly about 25 million years ago during the Miocene, accelerated a little bit 10 million years ago, and rapidly accelerated 3 million years ago. Prior to the existence of the contemporary mountain range, the Sierras were just the western slope of a high plateau known as the Nevada Plano, and modern Sierra rivers, such as the San Joaquin, Merced, Tuolumne, and others, began much further east of where they do today, in the aforementioned Nevada Plano. Rather than starting in the Sierra Nevada, they cut large canyons into the bedrock of what would become the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Geologists have determined the contemporary uplift history of the Sierras by analyzing the incision and erosion patterns and rates of these rivers through time. One such river that sheds particular light in terms of modern Sierra uplift history is the San Joaquin River. In short, the canyon of today's San Joaquin River is much too large for a river of its length and outflow volume, so something must be amiss. The theory is that the San Joaquin River actually predates the modern Sierras, and that the river must have started much further east than it does today to incise such a large canyon, kind of like what I was talking about just a minute ago. In essence, the river was much longer when it carved its canyon, so the Sierras must have been uplifted in the time between then and now. This same phenomenon is seen in pretty much every major river of the Sierra Nevada, and it alludes to slow uplift from 10 to 3 million years ago, and rapid uplift within the last 3 million years. Rapid uplift leads to deep incision, channel cutting, and higher rates of erosion of stream channels. This is first seen in the San Joaquin River at around the 3.2 million year ago mark, which is when it is postulated that the San Joaquin River was quote, beheaded, meaning this was when the modern Sierra Crest became higher than the high plateaus of the Nevada Plano and the basin and range east of it. Another line of evidence in piecing together the uplift history of the Sierra Nevada is the aforementioned pyroclastic flows from volcanoes in Nevada. On the western slopes of the Sierras, the pyroclastic flow record ends abruptly 3 million years ago, suggesting that this is when the Sierra Crest uplifted above the elevation of the Nevada Plano. In addition to being uplifted, the Sierra block has also been tilted, roughly 1.2 degrees towards the west within the last 10 million years. This is determined by measuring strikes and dips of volcanic units in the range, effectively recording how much they've been tilted. 
Uplift totals and rates of the Sierras have been mathematically calculated given geological observations, and it's been determined that the central Sierras have experienced 3,450 meters of uplift, with 2,100 of these meters occurring within the last 10 million years, and 45% of total uplift occurring within the last 3 million years. The southern Sierras have experienced more uplift, while the northern Sierras have experienced less. And this is pretty evident given the elevation profile of the Sierras. The highest part of the range is in the south, and the elevation of the range lowers as you head north. Uplift rate rapidly increased 3 million years ago, going from an uplift rate of 0.35 millimeters per year on average to 1 to 2 centimeters per year of average uplift, which continues to this day. All of this is outlined in a 1981 paper by Norman King Huber of the USGS, who really laid the groundwork of studying the modern uplift history of the Sierras. Now all of these totals are fine and dandy, but what geological processes were responsible for uplifting and tilting the Sierra Nevada? The answer is, basin and range, crustal extension. Given that it's pretty much a massive chunk of granodiorite, the Sierra Nevada is considered a stable block and behaves as such geophysically. As the basin and range experiences extension east of the Sierras, all of that extensive energy needs to end up somewhere. East of the basin and range, the stable block that's acted upon by the tectonics of the region is the Wasatch Mountains, which are currently being uplifted by the large Wasatch Fault, the furthest east fault in the basin and range. Geographically speaking, the Sierra Nevada is considered the western edge of the basin and range, so a huge portion of that extensive energy is transferred to the eastern escarpment of the Sierra Nevada. This generates active normal faults, and as North America experiences extension, the Sierras are uplifted and tilted. This is why the eastern escarpment of the Sierras is so steep, while the western slopes are actually quite gentle. The Sierras experience quite high amounts of uplift, and the faults that are uplifting the range are still active. In fact, the 1872 Lone Pine earthquake, which measured a 7.4 on the moment magnitude scale, was generated by one of these normal faults responsible for uplifting the Sierras. The ground in the area was instantaneously uplifted 15 to 20 feet during the earthquake. The origin of the processes that fuel crustal extension in the basin and range have been hotly debated, but it's been ubiquitously accepted that a large plume of magma exists beneath the region and is responsible for thinning, extending, and rotating the crust beneath Nevada, western Utah, and eastern California. The Sierra Nevada is home to 13 named glaciers today my personal favorite of which is Palisade Glacier, located some 12,700 feet high up on the northeast slope of the 14,252 foot North Palisade. Much like pretty much everywhere else on Earth, glaciation in the Sierras has rapidly retreated, due in combination to anthropogenic reasons and natural climate change. During the last ice age, the area was heavily glaciated, and evidence of this can be seen in many locations around the Sierras, especially in Yosemite National Park. Yosemite Valley itself is considered a U-shaped valley, carved by glaciers of the Tioga Glaciation 20,000 years ago. The iconic waterfalls in Yosemite Valley fall from hanging valleys carved by glaciers, and Half Dome itself is rounded because it was carved by a large glacier during the last glacial maximum. The Sierras are an absolutely gorgeous mountain range with a complex and exciting geologic history. They're revered for their beauty and outdoor recreation opportunities, and understanding them is key to understanding the entire planet's geologic past. Hopefully you learned something in today's installment of SOA, and enjoyed doing it. Next time you go to Yosemite, think about the geologic past there. Please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing if you haven't already, as it really helps me to get more content out to y'all. Thanks again for watching, and as always, PEACE! Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. If you enjoy content like this, please like the video and subscribe to the channel, and check out some of our other adventures right here. As always guys, thanks again and peace!